Um, I'm, uh, I missed the, um, the march here in Glasgow yesterday because I was on the train on my way up, but I presume quite a few of you went, did you? Yeah, lots of, oh, yeah, okay. So it's one of the biggest uh, demos, I think, in the country outside London. Um, that's a reminder of how um, the awareness of climate change uh, in the UK and in Europe and in the West in general uh, has, uh, I think, really changed um, since, since the summer of 2018. And what's interesting is that part of that shift in concern uh, is we used, to talk, we used to talk about climate change, those of us who worked on it, as a problem... Uh, that would really uh, impact on our grandchildren or possibly our children. Uh, and we would talk about it in particular, how it would be affecting people in poorer countries uh, soonest and the most. So there was very much a sense of it happening some, to someone else or somewhere else. And what we've seen since uh, the summer of 2018 is a shift in uh, perception and a shift in narrative where people started to feel that they themselves are in danger. And that being through a sense of uh, how uh, this, the pace and, and scale and momentum of climate change, destabilizing our weather, impacting on agriculture, and therefore threatening our own way of life. Now, there are pros and cons of that shift in awareness. Because of course it, it means that um, people feel they can't ignore this, perhaps. Uh, it brings it closer to home in some sense. And so that's quite mobilizing. But at the same time, that way of feeling anxious and in even some panic can, um, can sort of invite us, some of us, to turn away from others, close in, uh, and it's more like, a, how do I save my own, myself and my own? And so I um, am quite concerned that that is what could happen. And so with the Deep Adaptation Framework, which I'll talk about a bit more later, I'm really inviting people to, to, to look at the worst case scenarios uh, and to support each other in all the difficult emotions that that brings up and actually see how we can turn toward that trouble, stay open to it, inquire into it with sort of curiosity, compassion and respect for each other uh, rather than sort of um, those other tendencies that can happen, which is to just be angry, to look for how to blame someone and to look for a sense of some kind of psychological or practical safety as quick as possible. So, um, so the kind of conversations that we're going to have today, I think are the kind of conversations that millions of people will be having very soon, if, if not already. And Glasgow is going to be the center of that global awakening and possibly global anxiety just over a year from now. So it's the UN summit, the COP26 happening here, probably in, Dece it's in December. I don't know if the date's been announced, but it's definitely in Glasgow next year. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in the past uh, has always sought, the, the authors of their reports have always sought to be able to provide some sense of possibility for policymakers within the current paradigm. And so last year, with their October report that came out talking about staying below 1.5 degrees, for the first time, they really, really did sound the alarm, the urgent, imminent alarm. 
but they had to imagine technologies which don't exist to strip out 250 gigatons of carbon from the atmosphere in order to suggest that we do still have a 50-50 chance of staying below that warming threshold, which is a dangerous threshold to cross. Now, the new models that are being used, more advanced computer models on, on climate, are showing something which means there is no such wiggle room. Um, so the, 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 the initial reports coming out from the, the climate modelers uh, showing that actually on the current trajectory we're heading towards seven degrees warming this century, which would probably mean human extinction. And models are only models. So they were never predictions in the past, and so that isn't a prediction today either. And I think there's a lot of false confidence in the climate science community about models. Um, and so I don't think it would be right to just say that that means you know, it's over for the human race. But what it does mean is that the nature of conversations that will be happening in Glasgow amongst world leaders and leaders in business and leaders in civil society and the world's media, the nature of those conversations will be different from today and they'll be much more like the nature of conversations we're going to have today. And I think we'll be seeing bust-ups over whether we should be geoengineering. That would be a, a geoengineering the Arctic, for example. That would be at the top of the list discussed probably in Glasgow. There'll be arguments about how much adaptation should be supported and what is fair and just forms of adaptation and who should pay. There will be possibly the rise of eco-fascism in some parts of the world or at least sort of ideological movements growing around that, that we just have to sort of accept that we must just uh, give up on our old values because uh, the situation demands it. Now, in the face of all that, it will be quite important to show a very different way of responding to that predicament and those emotions. And that's what we're talking about today. That's why I wanted to come here to talk about deeper solidarity in the face of this predicament and to explore a different path. And so what I think is going to be really interesting is how that path can, that alternative path, of you know, compassion, curiosity, respect, and collaboration, that turning toward this predicament and engaging each other rather than sort of running for the hills or just being angry at someone for this, um, that alternative path, that can be walked by ourselves over the coming year and then be shown to the world uh, in Glasgow in December 2020. So I just want to say why I see it as as bad as all that. Um, most of you probably know all the, you know, you're engaged in, in climate and that's why you're here. Um, we know that we already have global one degree of ambient warming since 1850 or 1 1.5 since 1750. That doesn't, it's never sounded very much, but it, that was on a baseline of about 13 and a half degrees in 1750 global ambient temperature. So that's about 11% more energy in the atmosphere, which has already destabilized normal weather because it then destabilizes the jet stream and so on which then leads to the kinds of severe and frequent droughts and floods and and so on so extreme weather um and again that's already happening it's not theory and what is already happening as well uh, is that the permafrost so the frozen lands uh, near the arctic um, are melting at rates that were predicted for 2090 on worst case scenarios, emission scenarios and warming scenarios. So that, that, what was thought to be happening in 2090 is happening in 2019, according to peer-reviewed published research. So um, the real concern is what happens in the Arctic determines what happens in the rest of the world. Um, so Britain's top polar scientists and his team produced research which says if we lose Arctic ice uh, all year round, then that would lead to 50% more warming than all human caused warming. So if we're already at 1.5 degrees warming over 1750, then 
you know, that's half of that again if we lose our, our Arctic ice all year round. And a paper earlier this year in a geophysics journal predicted that uh, we could see the end of summer Arctic ice by 2030. Now, previously, um, it was really scientists speaking outside of peer-reviewed journals saying it was a possibility we would uh, lose summer ice in the Arctic um, uh, maybe even this year. That was some predictions a few years ago. It, we're, we're heading to, it looks like now losing Arctic summer ice is inevitable and therefore the problem is that could then lead on to year-round Arctic ice loss and therefore that kind of heating. That blasts us through the safe, the safer limits, whatever is safe. I mean, already it's unsafe, as we can see, if we look at the, uh, what's happening with disaster, natural disasters and impacts on food around the world. Um, when people hear this stuff, they sort of say, well, don't the IPCC say we've got until 2030 to change everything and save ourselves? Um, but as I said, in order to produce that report with that framing, they had to rely on technologies which don't exist yet at scale, uh, being rolled out in ways that have never been rolled out in human history. And, and uh, for uh, carbon emissions to stop doing what this graph shows, that's carbon emissions since 1850, and actually uh, a straight line coming right down to net zero. Um, so... There are climate scientists now who are rebelling against the, the norms in their community. And one is a guy called Dr. Wolfgang Noor, who I've interviewed on my blog. Uh, and he's also just uh, published a, a commentary yesterday uh, about this and saying that climate scientists need to recognize how they have actually been perhaps part of the problem in terms of not getting across the severity of the problem. Um, for example, this is a new thing to actually just plot carbon, CO2 emissions since 1850 in this way, which actually is quite close to an exponential curve. What he does with this is to say that for all the talk, for all the amazing initiatives at national, international and local levels of all kinds of initiatives on carbon, both cutting emissions and drawing down carbon, as far as the planet is concerned, con um, it's had no effect. Maybe it would be even steeper than that, probably would be. But we're seeing that kind of, uh, it maps to an exponential growth curve about 1.6% year on year. So what he did was, he said, well, if that is what's been happening so far, then it's not <coughs> unusual or contentious to say that seems to be what might be happening. I mean, the, keep, the emissions keep rising no matter what we're doing at the moment. And therefore, by extrapolating from that, as he's done with a dotted line there, he, he says that the uh, carbon budget, the amount of carbon that theoretically we can put in the atmosphere and still stay below uh, the two degrees warming target, um, uh, is going to be used up by 2025. So um, I don't think his way of thinking is going to be unusual come COP26 in, in, in Glasgow. There's going to have to be a lot more waking up to the, the situation. Um, so, yes, we may have a mass awakening and change and cut carbon. The problem is that won't stop a whole lot of bad stuff that's already locked into the system. So 90% of all the uh, heating from anthropogenic carbon emissions has gone into the oceans and so over time that's going to warm the atmosphere as, as an evening out. And some calculations are that the, the CO2 warming the atmosphere takes about 40 years for the full warming effect of an emission to actually warm. So we've got a, quite a lag, we've got quite a lot of warming locked in. And this, uh, in my deep adaptation paper, I was, I was writing to my field, which is the corporate sustainability field, saying it means that the, the premise of our sector, our profession, our academe, uh, is now redundant. Um, and, and, um, and a lot of people then say to me, well, that's um, a very negative and fatalistic uh, point of view, and uh, I believe it's not, and I'll say why. Um, the key thing to note is that uh, 
for, for many people in their own lives, uh, a breakdown or collapse has already happened in many parts and in many parts of the world. Um, the UN Secretary General said three weeks ago that climate disruption is now and everywhere. And no one reported that, by the way. Um, so, yeah, we've got, we've got uh, just last week, the Red Cross said, um, because of climate, uh, we've got about two million more people in need of humanitarian aid every week. And the FAO, the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, have published a report saying that hunger, having gone down over decades, is now on the rise again, and climate change, climate impacts on agriculture, is, is one of the main cross-cutting causes of that. Um, just yesterday, a uh, publication on, uh, on, uh, of a survey of top medical professionals all agreed around the world that climate change is the key worldwide driver of, new, of, of public health problems rising. And of course, we've got, yes, so we've got migration. We also have also the natural disasters that are happening far more intensely uh, and, and often now, and, you know, wiping out cities in Mozambique, for example. Um, and we also have failure of basic utilities. I mean, you know, now there's no water in, in Chennai and in India, um, and predictions that 22 cities next year won't have any water in India. Um, We've, in Indonesia, there's about, uh, there are over a thousand villages that don't have water now because of the drought and they're going to be shipped water from central government. Uh, so this is, this is happening now already. You know, millions of people are being bankrupted or injured. The livelihoods are taken. Um, they're being displaced or even killed because of natural disasters that are either happening or being made worse by climate change. And of course, Christian Aids and other NGOs have been publishing reports to, to, to point to the fundamental injustice of this situation, that these are, these are people whose carbon emissions are so much lower than, than the rich world, and yet they're already bearing the brunt. So this situation is motivating, and the climate strikes and the Extinction Rebellion are, are showing that. There is a coming together. And I, I, I gave a speech at the opening of the International Rebellion in Oxford Circus in April, and but I was saying how a lot of people that I'm working with in that context are not rebelling and protesting with a fairy tale vision of fixing climate change, but that waking up to how bad this is means that everything else becomes secondary. All the stories that we have about being pragmatic and sensible and so sort of, and, and weighing up different different concerns that goes out the window when you feel that this is upon us right now. It's killing people right now, and we are now in danger. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it's when you're in that situation, when you feel it that way, then yeah, it becomes well. What is your truth, and what do you? What's most what's most meaningful to you, and how do you want to live today, not at some point in the future? Um, and. A lot of people ask me, so when might Britain collapse as a society? What might that look like? And I don't know. But I do know that already we're seeing, like just last year, uh, food production in Britain, vegetables and grains went down about 20% and it went down over 20% in many European countries. Um, and that's just an example of how weird weather can therefore impact on something as basic as food. And the, uh, the UK government hadn't done a food security assessment for 10 years. The Parliamentary Environmental Audit Committee published a report last week uh, on this. And uh, the chair, Mary Cree MP, said, we're facing a food security crisis. So it's uh, not... It's not an uh, outlandish idea anymore that uh, we are vulnerable in the UK. Uh, that report also concluded that 20% of our food is coming from places that are now vulnerable to climate breakdown. So um, we, import, yeah, we import about 60% of our food. So there's a real issue here about why we are so, why we are so insecure and what can we do about it ourselves here. 
With collapse, I'm talking about an uneven ending of our normal modes of sustenance, security, uh, shelter, pleasure, and meaning. So it's, it's a, it doesn't mean everything all at once, and it doesn't mean we're all, it doesn't mean a Mad Max scenario, but it means life as we know it falling apart. And the question then becomes, well, what can we, what can we do to slow that? What can we do to prepare for that? What can we do to actually find meaning and joy and love and, and, and care and so on within that context? How can we be less, um, yeah, less, uh, less at risk unnecessarily? Um, some people say this is about giving, it sounds like it's giving up, and I say no, this isn't about giving up, this is about waking up to a wider agenda, about mutual responsibility, about learning how do we get into this mess. And part of that then is looking at those invisible norms in our way of relating that really helped us create this and ignore this until we've arrived at this point. And I think we'll talk about more of that that later. Um, the, uh, the kind of conversations we're having here today are the kind of conversations that the whole planet is going to be having in the future. Uh, and so it becomes a really important issue about how we hold each other in that. Um, and to move beyond panic and uh, towards what you, maybe we could call eco-solidarity. Um, a sense that rather than uh, becoming preppers, um, building bunkers or fortresses or, uh, or whatever, actually exploring uh, what meaningful resilience in the face of this might look like, both practically and emotionally. And I think that's, that's multi-layered. So there's so much action we can take at a local level, but also um, there's no point in just relying on uh, your local allotment and your local currency and so on if, uh, if there's a hosepipe ban <laughs> and if um, nobody else is doing that and everyone else around you is hungry. So I think you then have to work at local government levels and national government levels. And of course, we, we, ha we are one humanity and so we've got to look at, it's natural to look at how we can help people the most affected. And I think that there is, we can look at this as a, this predicament as a severe mirror on our mainstream culture and psychology, our self-image, and, and then ask deep questions and, and respond in a way which um, is beautiful. Um, we know also a lot of people won't respond that way. But, so I don't, I don't have a vision of a future whereby there's a mass spiritual awakening, a huge coming together, and we help each other through this. Um, but I know that will be the case in some places for some people. Uh, and so I feel motivated by that, which is to just, you know, just to try and do what we can to be part of that. Um, so yeah, I don't believe that we can, uh, our response is to simply to retreat locally. And I know that um, some of the strategists and founders of Extinction Rebellion, uh, they feel that it's probably too late to preserve this way of life. Um, but they didn't really want to talk about that because they felt that if people started to think that society will collapse, that people will naturally turn towards local transition initiatives, uh, how to grow your own and, and so on. And what they really wanted to do is to maintain a focus on government action and invite people to recognize that the climate crisis is a political crisis and it will demand political act, uh, solutions and action. But for me, um, the adaptation agenda is a political agenda as well. And so I think it's going to be really important for not just Extinction Rebellion, but the climate strike movement and even the mainstream NGOs in the environment like Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth and WWF and so on, to embrace fair adaptation as central to what they talk about. Because we already know that inequality is outrageous in Britain and elsewhere. 
We already know that about 10% of the top earners in the world are responsible for over 50% of existing carbon emissions. We already know that the damages from current levels of climate change are being disproportionately borne by the poor and disadvantaged of the world. And already in Britain, food prices have been going up and climate change is a, at the moment, small factor in that. But that means that you know, people living in, having to choose between heating or eating in Britain um, or having to buy crap food because it's cheap and they just need to find you know, cheap calories for their families, that they are already suffering and going to be more so. So I think fair adaptation is, is something that we really, really need to see adopted. And I would say even more than deep adaptation. Basically, adaptation, if you, if you at the moment can't conceive of society falling apart and you want to preserve things as they are, then okay, let's do what we can, but let's be as fair as possible about that and who pays. And the, 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 the rich in Britain and around the world need to pay way more and have to change their lives way more than ordinary people. Um, the deep adaptation framework I uh, came up with because I realised that a lot of people find it very difficult, myself included, to really look at this predicament in a sort of a curious generative way. So I just came up with a framework which um, is four questions. Um, in light of this predicament, what is it that we most value that we want to keep? I called that resilience. Um, what is it that we can let go of, otherwise we'll make matters worse? I call that relinquishment. What is it that we could bring back? Ways of life, ways of producing, ways of having fun together. What is it that we could bring back that will help us with the difficulties ahead? And I call that restoration. And then finally, at the fourth R, um, reconciliation. And that's based on the idea that no matter what we do, uh, we're not in control. We don't actually know how bad things will get. And therefore, we need to find some equanimity, some calm, some peace with that. And that we can be engaged in doing what we believe in, even though we don't know whether we'll achieve our goals. So a passion for acting on what we believe in without certainty of the outcome. So I call it reconciliation with the question is, you know, with what and, and, and whom could we make peace with? Now that we recognize impermanence, now we recognize our mutual mortality, our lack of control. So it's a, it's a deeper, more philosophical question about how we can somehow be at peace with this uncertainty now. And as I said earlier, this is, for, to me is a positive agenda. Um, people, some people complain that this sounds fatalistic or negative or so on, but for me it's not giving up. It's about waking up to a much wider agenda, mutual solidarity and asking deep questions about how we got into this predicament, because otherwise we risk um, making matters worse uh, with our responses. Um, and so for me there's I'm, I'm, at the moment, I'm inquiring into those deep cultural norms which are part of why we're, we're in this difficult situation. Um, and I think the concept of alienation is really interesting here. Alienation from self, other, and nature. Um, when I say alienation, it's that there are, there are cultural norms whereby certain emotions are welcome and others are not. So at the moment, for example, a lot of people um, think that for themselves to feel grief, shock, pain, confusion, bewilderment, all this sort of stuff, or for someone to say something that means another person will feel those difficult emotions, that's, not, that's wrong. There's this kind of mutual policing of our emotions and what's appropriate, this pain aversion. And I think that is part of patriarchy, uh, that's, and that's fucking wrong. <laughs> so, uh, and I embellish my language there just to say, uh, it's time to be okay with being outraged 
angry, shocked. To feel it's unbearable to be in this situation. That's normal, that's natural. It's normal and natural to actually feel despair and to be depressed about this situation. That's normal, it's right. So that's part of it. It's like, what are those invisible norms that have been silencing us, turning us into hard workers and uh, needy consumers? So it's the first thing. Um, another form of alienation is that, you know, we separation from nature and that um, we live in stories which say that we are center of the universe, we're different from nature, that desacralizes nature and therefore we, we just see them as resources and therefore we don't feel the pain of what's happening when 200 species are going extinct every day, when nature is being trashed for profit. Um, but also there's the, the othering, the alienation from, from other people where we don't see them as, as somehow as human as ourselves. And this happens, that, that othering can happen at levels of society, uh, but also can happen just in between us in the room because we experience each other as stories of each other rather than each other. And um, so for someone in my position, you know, I inhabit a, an identity in society that has a lot of privilege. Um, I realize that, so for old white guys, um, we have to realize that maybe our habits of thinking and behaving have been privileged in this culture, and this culture has become omnicidal, destroying life on earth. And so we have to take a moment and then look at what, how, we, how we act in the world and how we think. So for me, deep solidarity means that it will be ongoing work for people like me to inquire into um, what might I be doing wrong uh, and invite critical feedback and to explore new ways of relating, which is to support people unlike me um, to have more influence in the world than me. Um, in a one-to-one -one situation, it's called holding space. But I think collectively, um, we don't need more old white guys to be in charge. Uh, and instead, holding space for the emergence of a whole new way of being in the world. So that's why I was very happy to come here and talk about that aspect of, of deep solidarity. Um, and there are so many, the problem is we face a completely different thing. It's almost like uh, we've got like patriarchy was under threat and gave itself a steroid injection and a, an amphetamines jab or whatever. And, and so we have people, idiots like Bolsonaro, the president of Brazil, saying that concern from the West about the Amazon is neo-imperialism, not recognizing that his whole world view and his way of um, denigrating and trashing the identity and the humanity of indigenous peoples living in those forests is domestic imperialism. That's what he is. And so, you know, someone on a minimum wage in Glasgow giving money to a charity supporting the rights of forest dwellers in Amazon, what, they're imperialists? Idiots. So um, we've got to understand that, that you know, this, this, under, this, this agenda of decolonization and anti-imperialism um, is not about nationality, is not necessarily about race or gender. It's about how we all inquire into these processes of alienation and othering that we do every day. So just to summarize, um, Already millions of people are suffering from our past inaction and every minute that emissions continue to rise is worsening our own chances of survival now. So governments must act to help us avoid a worsening of the situation but also to urgently to help people who are suffering now and that means here in Britain but also around the world as we've described. And I, I am concerned that as, people, as anxiety rises we may see the rise of um, populist, nativist, and possibly eco-fascist uh, movements. 
Uh, and so it's really important that we explore alternative ways of being in relation to this situation, that we ourselves process all those difficult emotions and return to um, love and rage rather than uh, just something, something else. Um, so, and I'm re that's why it's really important what happens in Glasgow over the coming year and therefore what you can tell the thousands of people coming from all over the world about ways of being in the light of this predicament. So thanks for the invite. Thank you. Um, this feels like an incredibly tough space to speak into, uh, a tough topic to, to speak to. Um, and it's been an emotional journey preparing for uh, what I might share, um, uh, what I might bring into this space to help with uh, and, uh, and, and in the hope that it's useful to the discussions that follow. Um, and I wanted to start with sharing some of my frames of reference um, where I'm coming to um, in, 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 in uh, my observations around uh, or where I'm coming from uh, in my observations around um, deep solidarity um, and, and because I think, you know, it's about practicing how we get better at making visible the invisible norms that we, uh, that we impose, the, the self-limitations we're regularly imposing on how we understand how to live our lives. Um, so I'm going to start with some of my very personal frames of reference. Um, Uh, uh, so I was born in Essex, uh, early motorway protests that took place. So this was my first ever direct action, uh, protesting, um, shutting down a mahogany merchant just outside Oxford. Um, um, and just kind of trying to bring in stories to, uh, in the hope that, that something useful is there for, and then to draw from that some of the, the, the learning that I feel that I'm still unpacking from those experiences. Um, and that led to um, uh, spending time at different motorway protests that were happening around the UK uh, in the mid 90s <clears throat> uh, while I was um, living at Faz Lane Peace Camp, um, stopping nuclear warhead convoys, uh, protesting the arrival of uh, the Trident submarines on the Clyde. Um, I'll come to why I think this is useful. Um, and from and from there, I found myself at Pollock Free State. Uh, which was a protest started by local people. The press wanted you to, to believe that it was um, eco-activists kind of helicoptering in, but it was, it was local people uh, uh, who were protesting a motorway going through their, the ha their housing scheme in South Glasgow, um, which would cut off access to their woods, which was their only form of escape from um, damp housing, day-to-day uh, -day life with an undercurrent of violence. Um, uh, the, the, the founders talk about fighting with your, you know, kind of backing up your dad on the street with uh, brim poles. Uh, and that was people's daily reality. So um, I, I was keen to sort of set that in context. Um, so it kind of became semi-permanent. Uh, we it acquired the name Pollock Free State. Uh, we declared independence from the UK in August '94, um, and the the name Free State triggered quite a lot of 
interesting discussions around the campfire about what it meant to be free, um, the kind of responsibilities that come with freedom, particularly when um, <clears throat> the, the cultural norms in that area were taking jellies and um, drinking during the day, um, uh, uh, you know, I still got the I still got the conversations kind of running through my head that that were happening around the fire and um, so anyway that that led us to issue uh, passports we had about a thousand um, passport carrying citizens don't know if there's any any of you here today um, we made our own stamps uh, we set up our own free university of Pollock. Um, and, and I think there was something about just reframing our understanding of what was happening in that woodland that, that felt really important in, in opening up the, the possibilities, uh, opening up the imagina imaginal realm as to what's possible. It kind of created a liminal space um, where, where interesting things could happen. Um, we even had a school strike. I'm hoping that that you'll see a snippet of that, but um, it was, again, the press wanted you to believe that that was orchestrated by the uh, activists. It wasn't the kids uh, quite rightly um, striked from school because they recognized that asthma was going to be an issue for them with the increase in pollution. Um, <clears throat> and, and I think, you know, there was a lot of learning that took place um, that, you know, there was the protest in the motorway, but there was also the learning around uh, how do you create some sense of stability and safety in a space where there's very minimal police presence. There wasn't a lot of police presence. It was a dark area, woodland. There was no security lighting, no safety rails, all the things that we're used to uh, uh, that kind of give us this impression that we're safe. There were three near deaths um, over the time we were living there. And, and yet there was a deeper sense of safety. There's a paradox there, and I'm still unpacking that. A, a deeper sense of safety amongst uh, physical discomfort. Uh, we spent a winter there in minus 20. People were waking up with ice in their beards. Um, we were pretty grateful to uh, people from traveling backgrounds who uh, showed us how to make proper benders. Um, uh, and it showed up the things you take for granted when you're, you know, when we live in comfort, in the in the relative comfort. Um, even even things like you would forget to switch the light on because you forgot that you could. Um, so it was kind of adjusting to that. Um, so the, and 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 then I had the other thing I want. Yeah. So this is one of the the marches coming up from Glasgow. Uh, at the time. Um, the other thing I think was about learning how to be in an incredibly diverse community of place. Um, you were living alongside one another, you rubbed one another up the wrong way, um, there were plenty of arguments, um, chairs threw across the fire on more than one occasion, in fact that was me. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, I think that added to the richness and that's something that we still work with and we learned from today. Um, I wanted to also mention something about uh, my personal story in this. Um, I, I met and uh, married one of the, the local, the, the, lo the main local man um, who, who founded the, who, who sort of sat up the tree for nine days and did a crane sit for three days. Um, um, we had three children, they're now in their early 20s, so in terms of my position in this conversation, I, you know, it's bringing that sense of being a mother to three young adults, um, and how you, you know, you can no longer wrestle with the kind of safety that you could, even in, even in a, a place where violence was erupting all the time, like one time Colin passed me our one-year-old, uh, so he could deal with somebody who was coming at him with a samurai sword. Um, the kind of, uh, the kind of, um, what we're looking at in terms of uh, climate collapse means that, you know, ev even that feels like, you know, obviously comparatively safe. 
Um, anyway, the motorway went through, um, but we felt that we learned a lot about how to make community in a, in a quite a difficult space. Then there's something about the theme of discomfort um, and what can come from that, that, that um, you know, uh, I hope comes up. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, 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 we understood that to be about how we reconvene a sense of peoplehood, what it means to be a people, rather than go down the line of establishing um, an organization uh, and going down that kind of route. Um, so we started uh, the, the Galgil. Um, uh, and the Galgil of history were uh, the communities settling on the west coast of Scotland. They were assimilated into Gaelic culture, um, so they were referred to as the Gal Gale, which means strange or foreign Gales. Um, and for us, it was a way of recognizing that there's a bit of the native and a bit of the indigenous in all of us in modern times. So how do we reconstitute new ways of belonging that um, allow you to bring in cultural heritage without it becoming ethnically exclusive, uh, even including uh, Essex Mongols such as myself. And the Galgil of history were associated with uh, the Berlin, which is um, uh, Hebridean galley. Um, and uh, Colin quickly realized that we could achieve a lot of our social and cultural goals um, by involving the local community in building boats. And I think we kind of then started to move and integrate, I guess, environmental justice with social justice. Um, uh, so, yeah, we, we started in a show people's yard, uh, then we moved to the uh, old scrap dealer's yard before we ended up in this place here. Um, we, we've come to understand the importance of making uh, and giving people the skills to, to make as being core to not only that unalienated activity of what makes us human and connects us with our species essence, um, but also is core to real resilience. There's a lot of um, resilience in, in policy narratives. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, but but making and having the skills to make, whether that's uh, you know uh, tools to to or whether that's growing food, uh, these are going to be key um, uh, in terms of really guaranteeing some sort of uh, way of creating our own existence, as well as bringing meaning. I think that's one of the things that you know meaning has become bleached out for many of the communities that we that where where we, where we are working. Um, and it's it's uh, also about um, finding way finding ways of building community around demanding common task, um, uh, exploring ways in which we can work together that that, that generate our humanity, um, connect us to more love, more be beauty, more truth, more meaning, um, and. Uh, Yeah, so, and um, I guess I, w I also want to say there's, there's two ways in which people understand what we do. Sometimes people see it as we helping people with addiction issues, homelessness, mental health issues so they can get fixed, or about employability, we're giving people skills and confidence so they can become economically productive. Um, e even some funders think that's what we do. Uh, but increasingly, drawing on our experience and our roots in the free state, we're understanding, we're, we're coming to that with a different take. So lately we think we're prototyping different ways of organizing society, um, uh, creating an experience of a different way of, of being, a place to unlearn the patriarchy, uh, to heal trauma, um, and to, to practice coming together to, it, because it's messy. And we need to get much better as, than we are at making mistakes. Um, and, and ways in which we can, we can unlearn the old narratives, dismantle the, the, the internal, you know, we've internalized the frameworks of capitalism. 
Um, and unless we start to see that in ourselves and dismantle that, um, I think we, uh, even our best efforts, even even when we bring our heads to it, we'll we'll recreate those those patterns. Um, I just wanted to mention the rowing because this is where the guys are today. Um, they're rowing up from Dumbarton Rock to um, the crane at Finiston. And something about uh, how we create experiences where you know it's not it it, it goes beyond the what the, the words. I mean that's one of the other things I want to say how inadequate words and language feels in response to what we're facing. So something about creating experiences, creating encounters, which really allow us to 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 really that touch our humanity and um, reveal our humanity. Um, many people describe that feeling when they when they come to uh, uh, visit the workshop, which you'd all be welcome to do, by the way. Um, so uh, just to summarize. Um, what have those experiences taught me about solidarity? I think overriding beyond the activism, I feel that there's something about the experience of community uh, in and around times of struggle that goes right back to Vaseline Peace Camp, um, uh, you know, Twyford Down, uh, was around that fire in, in, in Pollock. Um, <clears throat> something about madness that I haven't quite unpacked yet, but it's maybe to do with that internal breakdown. We need to break down. Um, and so I think something about being in solidarity with people in different, with different mental capacities, uh, because they also bring frames which allow us to see things completely differently. Um, Ishbel Monroe, who was involved in the armed standoff at Oka in Nova Scotia, said that she was doing some street performance, um, and the, the the local uh, mental institute asked if she would come and do if their group would come and do performance for the the residents, and they said, "Are you sure? This is quite dark." And this is going, I think this is in the eighties. This was this was even before. Um, I, I, I was involved in anything, but um, late 80s, and they're, are you sure? This is quite dark. This is like an environmental play. It's quite dark, are you sure? And they said, yeah, they'll just enjoy it. It'll just be a performance. And she said they, they started, um, and within about 10 minutes, and through the course of the performance, about five different people stood up at different times and said, you see, this is what, they've been, this is what I've been trying to say, and they put me in here, and they were getting dragged out of the main hall uh, by the psychiatric nurses. So it's like, how do we embrace our own breakdown by being in solidarity with people? You know, I know there's, a, the, I, I love the work like around the madness uh, solidarity network and things like that. Um, so I guess everything I feel that, um, I don't know if you can read that, can you read that? That, that I've learned about solidarity could probably also be summed up in, in this quote from Eduardo Galeano. Um, I don't believe in charity, I believe in solidarity. Charity is so vertical, it goes from top to bottom. Solidarity is horizontal, it respects the other person. So it's something about uh, a willingness to be transformed, which I think is um, Gramsci. Um, and that's about allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, to make mistakes, uh, to come into relationships of solidarity uh, with, a, with a readiness to learn um, rather than to help. Um, I'm trying to speed up because I'm aware that I'm over time. Um, so something about how we explore solidarity as a personal practice, but also as a collective practice. Um, I think it's an active form of resistance in the face of uh, the ideologies in which the current structures are founded. It, through acts of solidarity, we begin to dismantle uh, the atomized society uh, which drives consumerism. Um, in the face of collapse, I think as Jem said, there's an ethical imperative there. Um, the idea that those, the, the, the that those in poorer communities in the UK and in the global south um, who have least benefited from the behaviors that have driven climate change 
uh, will suffer the most. Um, it's just untenable. Uh, it's, for me, it's a choice between facing collapse in a way in which we can make community in a dignified way or, or survive in the, the, the ugliest of possible scenarios. Um, uh, and, and then beyond that kind of no, that ethical imperative, for me, there's some really practical things there, like from what I've observed for the last 28 years of, of, of living in, in, in Govan, there's expertise there. People have learned how to survive with hunger. Uh, austerity policies and shank, sanctions have kind of sharpened those skills. Um, people have learned how to survive with trauma, violence, the constant threat of violence. People talk about not being able to sleep because the, their door has been kicked in so many times. Um, and that's been why they've reoffended because they know where they are when they're in, in prison. Uh, people having poor access to healthcare, people who are showing incredible resilience in, in, in the face of day-to-day -day anxiety and uncertainty. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to say also, um, for me, solidarity is a collective response in, 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 in the face of, of collapse. Um, recognizes that, that, that we need to recover our understanding of what community means. It's been become so impoverished by uh, political narratives, um, and yet it was essential to survival. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and crafting communities, uh, eking a life out um, in, in, in places like Lewis 100 years ago, um, and communities uh, that are living in subsistence ways will tell you that it's impossible to survive on your own, no matter how many tins of beans you've got stockpiled. And I mean, I'm still trying to I'm still trying to work these these ideas and these thoughts through uh, as I'm encountering the kind of what the what the scenarios about potential collapse uh, and climate collapse and the different kind of collapses that we're looking at uh, might mean. Um, and I also just wanted to say that I think community is, has, has also some elements of mitigation in it. It's about how we, um, how we start to dismantle uh, uh, the frameworks of and the ideologies that have driven um, our current economic systems. Um, it's a, and it's a training ground for crisis. Um, and so I'm trying to think how... how um, there's other things I was going to say, but I, I think I'll draw it to close there and maybe feed them in through the discussion. Um, but just to finish on saying, you know, I think uh, solidarity is a form of resistance, um, and that resistance can be a generative practice that grows resilient communities, and I think makes it more likely that whatever future we're facing, we can face that with more dignity.